So for this while during the series, I'm going to be discussing the ninth gate completely and so utterly spoiling it for anybody who is worried about being spoiled. The ninth gate, and I'm going to read the plot here and then discuss the uh, Kabbalah imagery in it, basically, uh, from an article I found online. So, quote from the plot on Wiki. Dean Corso, a New York City rare book dealer, makes his living conning people into selling him valuable antique books for a low price, and then reselling them to private collectors. Corso meets with wealthy book collector Boris Vicon, who has recently acquired a copy of the fictional book The Nine Gates of the Kingdom of Shadows by 17th century author Aristide Torquia, one of only three extant copies. The book is an adaptation of one written by the devil himself and purportedly contains the means to summon the devil and acquire invincibility and immortality. Balkan believes two of the copies are forgeries. He hires Corso to check all three and acquire the legitimate one by any means necessary. I also want to point out that this is talking about the nine gates of the kingdom of shadows. That would be the nine gates of the kingdom of hell versus the nine gates of the kingdom of Christ, the heavenly kingdom. And just want to point out that the heavenly Christ, he tells us that we can have immortality too. So there are going to be parallels and one is, you know, the evil way and one is the good way. Continuing on, a uh, Bicon's copy was acquired from Andrew Tuff Telfer, who killed himself soon after. Telfer's widow, Liana, seduces Corso in a failed attempt to get the book back. Meanwhile, Corso leaves the book for safekeeping with the bookseller, Bernie Rothstein, who is then murdered. His corpse is found posed like an engraving in The Nine Gates. Corso travels to Toledo, Spain. The Seneza brothers, book restorers, show him that three of the engravings are signed LCF. Corso deduces that Lucifer himself designed and cut them. Corso travels to Sintra, Portugal to compare Victor Fargus's copy of the book to Balkines. To Corso's surprise, he discovers that the signature LCF is found in three different engravings, which vary in small but significant details from the images in the Balkine copy. The next morning, a mysterious young woman, identified only as the girl, who appears to have been shadowing Corso since Balkan hired him, awakens Corso and leads him to Fargus's house. He finds the old man murdered, and the LCF signed engravings ripped out of that copy. In Paris, Corso visits the Baroness Kessler, who owns the third copy. At first, the Baroness refuses to cooperate, but Corso intrigues her with evidence that the engravings dif differ among the three copies. He explains his idea. Each copy contains three different LCF signed engravings. Therefore, all three copies are required for the ritual. Corso finds LCF on three different engravings in the Baroness's book, confirming his theory. Kessler is killed. And the girl rescues Corso from Liana's boy bodyguard. Uh, when Liana steals Balkine's copy from Corso's hotel room, he follows her and witnesses her using the book in a Satanist ceremony. Balkan suddenly interrupts the ceremony, kills Liana, and leaves with the engraved pages and his own intact copy. Corso pursues Balkan to a remote castle depicted in one of the engravings and finds Balkan preparing the final ritual. After a struggle, Balkan traps Corso in a hole in the floor. Balkan performs his summoning ritual. He arranges the engravings on a makeshift altar and recites a series of phrases related to each of the nine engravings. Balkan then douses the floor and himself with gasoline and sets it alight, believing himself to be immune to suffering. Balkan's invocation fails and he screams in pain as the flames engulf him. Corso frees himself, shoots Balkan, takes the engravings, and escapes. Outside, the girl appears and has sex with him by the light of the burning castle, her eyes and face seeming to change as she writhes on top of Corso. She tells him that Balkan failed because the ninth engraving he had used was a forgery. On her suggestion, before she disappears, Corso returns to the Sons of Brothers' now vacant shop. By chance, he finds there the authentic ninth engraving. 
On it, there is a likeness of the girl with the last engraving in hand. Corso returns to the castle. He completes the ritual and crosses through the ninth gate into the light. Notice that it's light. Um, this is seemingly um, not so much a Satanist story as a Luciferian tale. Um, but I also wanted to point out that it talks about how they kept doing these rituals and things like that. But it seems like, I've watched a few videos on it, discussing it, decoding it, and all that stuff. And it seems like um, the, the cards, the pictures that were in the book, were their representation of like tarot cards. And it's all about his life throughout the movie. As, you know, he sees the hanged man, and then he sees the hanged man. And he sees the castle, and then he sees the castle in real life. And he sees the girl, and that's, of course, what happened in his real life. He actually, in this case, he would have um, performed the ninth engraving, not so much when he found it, so much as when he was with the girl that he had sex with. So, um, going to be discussing that here. I guess I'll bring that up right now um, as I think of it before I forget. The girl and him are coming together as one body. That's what happens when you have sex. You become one flesh. So, in um, the movie, she actually puts like uh, the number three, like Roman numeral three, but that could be the Vav sign as they have on the monster can, and that is um, a 666 sign then. So, he was, she was marking his forehead in blood with a 666 sign, marking him as the beast, basically, giving him the mark of the beast. And she was the whore Babylon riding the beast in this last um, engraving, that is the ninth gate, to the Antichrist body. It's becoming one with the whore. So that's what happens in the opposite of the scripture, um, is that those that antichrist body it's all those people because we are the body of christ but um mainstream christianity is the body of the antichrist so they are all saying that they're in the body of the christ they, they come as an angel of light they come as a messenger of light um, but they're actually filled with the antichrist spirit instead so they come as an angel of light but they look like the beast as i mentioned earlier in the series um, when somebody comes to you and says that they come as a Christian, they're taking the name of Christ, they're coming in the name of Christ, and they are blaspheming our Father when they say they come from Him and sin, because that's how you profane Father's holy name. And they're blaspheming Him, and they're also giving Him that bad reputation. And when they are attacking the brethren, the true body of Christ, then they are working for the Antichrist, basically. And they become like Satan, the accuser. So they are a messenger of Satan, the accuser, when they are giving you messages, accusing you of things. So the mainstream Christians do believe that's like the body of the Antichrist. This is according to scripture. <laughs> and uh, they would just say, I'm twisting it, but it is what it is. So they become one with the Antichrist beast when the whore is riding the beast um, and they're in that body. So I do believe the whore is more the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Church basically. I mean Rome has always been the whore that they're going after, that pagan, pagan trinity, pagan idolatry. Um, but it's not surprising that the uh, Christian Church, the mainstream Christian Church is full of pagan ideas and uh, not scriptural at all. And so I'll leave some links below, well, a playlist of some Ninth Gate Symbolism Decode uh, videos, which were interesting, if you're interested in it. And now I'm going to read from uh, this, the big picture. Uh, the Ninth Gate is a film by well-known director Roman Polanski, and I believe that he was supposedly accused of um, pedophilia, I believe. And uh, so this guy seems to be more pro him uh, versus con. But uh, regardless, this isn't even who wrote uh, what's coming up. He says, 
This is the first section of nine in which Ms. Whitney relates the contents of the movie and the book to the Kabbalah and the Tree of Life. In the process, she makes it clear that the profound truths that seem to be lurking in the Ninth Gate are almost certainly intended by all of the creators of the book and movie. The nine sections include, uh, this is the big picture, the first one, and uh, I'll get into the next ones um, as I go. And it talks about the engravings from the book that it discusses, which you know you can go look up. I'm not going to get into all that here. A Kabbalistic Key to the Ninth Gate. Roman Polanski's Journey Beyond Evil, 1, the big picture. Light shines in Polanski's darkness. In the first scene of the film, The Ninth Gate, an older, a very wealthy, and cultured gentleman calmly commits suicide by hanging himself from the chandelier in his tastefully appointed library, full of priceless rare books. Once his feet have stopped twitching, the camera pans across the shelves behind him to a vacant spot where one book is missing. As we later discover, that book is The Nine Gates of the Kingdom of Shadows, a 17th century grimoire, uh, 1666 to be precise. Of course, if you flip that over, well, you've got the 666. This was actually made in 1999, which if you flip that over, you've got the 666. Uh, so anyway, continuing on, said to have been co-authored by the devil himself. Over the course of the film, five more people will suffer violent deaths because of their associations with this infamous book. Three of these victims are self-described Satanists. The first, a crippled German baroness and best-selling author on the subject of the devil, is strangled in her wheelchair and her famous library of satanic books set ablaze. Another, a beautiful iron-willed sex-exploiting vamp, nude under her hooded black robe, is choked with her own pentacle necklace while conducting a fire-lit group satanic ritual at her secluded French chateau. The final victim, a billionaire business mogul, a collector of occult books, and cold-blooded serial murderer, burns himself alive in a deserted Cathar castle while performing a ritual which he is convinced will summon the devil. Now try to imagine for a moment reading this brief outline of the setting for a horror murder mystery film and thinking to yourself, wow, this would be the perfect vehicle to introduce the general public to the principles of one of the world's greatest traditional spiritual teachings of the Kabbalah's Tree of Life. Personally, I still can't quite imagine how that particular chain of thought ever came together. Even the esteemed author of the book on which the screenplay was based wasn't quite that ambitious, although he did start the ball rolling by commissioning the series of nine symbolic engravings which appear in the Devil's Book, whose symbols tell the story of the journey on the tree. But however far-fetched this idea may seem, the film's co-writer and director Roman Polanski didn't just think it, he actually pulled it off. So. I am not promoting anything here. I'm just sharing um, the opposite way because I want to discuss on how things can be seen um, uh, flipped, basically. How do you flip what we've seen here um, as far as the road to heaven? When it comes to popular films with spiritual themes, it's impossible not to think of the most recent high-profile example the one in which a zealously pious director presented traditional religious imagery and what many felt was a psychologically disturbing, obsessively sadistic, ugly, and dispiriting way to deliver a message which was widely perceived to be controversial, religiously polarizing, and divisive. The contrast between this and Polanski's film could hardly be greater or more ironic. The Ninth Gate Despite the dark reputation of its director, is a quirky, unassuming, but genuinely redemptive, non-denominational morality play in which almost all the parts are played by evil Satanists, and one enigmatic character in particular is widely speculated to be Lucifer herself, that is, the girl. Um, but he becomes one with her, so it's the body of Lucifer, the body of the Antichrist, basically. Polanski's surprising twist of using over-the-top murderous devil worshippers in an almost tongue-in-cheek way to illustrate a message of genuine non-sectarian spiritual hope definitely makes for a refreshing change. In fact, I can't think of a film that more richly deserves to develop a widespread intelligent cult following. The only element missing up to now has been a publicly accessible key to the mysterious unexplained symbolism of the engravings which appear in the film's infamous book which is why I decided to write this article. Two Hidden Keys to the Nine Gates 
I saw the film The Ninth Gate the first time mostly because Johnny Depp was in it and he can usually be relied on to pick interesting projects. The engravings intrigued me, but until I began to look seriously at their symbolism, I had no idea how highly unusual the film actually is. In my opinion, it's one of a kind because it has done something that no other movie that I'm aware of has attempted. Although the tarot's hanged man, hermit, death, and fool were easy to recognize, other symbols in the series of engravings were more elusive. And as I began the process of interpreting them, I wasn't sure how deep the symbolism would go or how internally consistent it would be. What I discovered went far beyond anything I had expected. What the designer of the engravings has actually done is to use a mixture of symbols taken from the tarot and the Kabbalah's tree of life to describe key transition points on the journey of spiritual evolution up the tree, beginning at the bottom with ego consciousness, making the crossing at the middle of the tree into the realm of soul to achieve the union of ego with soul and culminating at the top of the tree with the wedding of soul to spirit and the opening of the ninth gate. In order to understand the meaning of the engravings, we must begin to become familiar with the two occult keys to their symbolism. The diagram of the Kabbalah, Kabbalah's great teaching of spiritual synthesis, the tree of life, and the meaning of a half dozen or so symbolic figures taken from the greater trumps, the major arcana of the tarot, which are traditionally assigned to describe the nature of certain paths on the tree. Two sets of gates, the choice, light, or fire. The film tells us there are three copies of the book, the nine gates of the kingdom of shadows, and that each book contains nine engravings, each engraving representing one of the nine gates. Before I forget, something that just came into my mind is that I have always just been a Christian growing up, and I believe that we should read the Bible, and I believe the Bible is canon, and last year when I decided that I would study that, um, I found out that the Bible should not be considered canon, or the quote-unquote word of God. It says it is not. There are words of God in it, because the prophets are in there, but it is not... Um, 100% our father Yahweh and it actually blasphemes his name a lot so I started reading other things and I was seeing truths in them as I mentioned earlier the the um, Bhagavad Gita talks about the uh, city of nine gates and it's talking about what Yehoshua said he said that we were supposed to be one with him and so I'm finding truth in these other uh, books and then I see that there's falsehoods there are in everything there's truth and falsehood in everything and as I mentioned in my um, Eden's trees playlist it could be that the the knowledge of good and evil that tree of knowledge of good and evil is the scriptures the books we were told never to write things down it was the fallen angels that taught us to write things down and when you write things down you get good and evil and it is a book it is um, wood you know the book is wood so it comes from a tree it's a dead tree it's a tree of life of good and evil a death actually a tree of death because <laughs> it's dead um so it's the opposite of the tree of life the tree of death is uh, the book of um, good and evil basically but we're supposed to follow the holy spirit to the truth and read these things and pick up how it part the good from the bad and so, of course, that's what this is talking about, with there being three different copies of the book. Um, it's suggesting that, you know, the way to the nine gates of the kingdom of shadows is not just in one book. You have to study three different books. And that is reminding me of the Masons who have different books. Hold on a second. Okay, this is a page on the Freemasonic Bible, but it's mentioning that they do have these four different books. It says there's the Holy Bible, um, the Jewish Tanakh, the Muslim Quran, and the Hindu Bhagavad Gita, which I just mentioned has the same stuff from the Bible in it. Um, so, in actuality, this is three books because the Tanakh is inside the Bible. Um, unless there's more to the Tanakh than I know of, uh, this is three different books, three different religious books here. You've got the Hindu one, the Muslim one, and the Christian or Jewish one, Judeo-Christian one, I guess. So you've got three different books, and there's some good in each of them. 
And uh, from what I can tell, it looks like a third of it is good, and 66% of it would be evil. Uh, according to this, um, you know, this is the backwards, the movie is the backwards way, remember that. I'm looking at it to look at the opposite, and we see that that's what this is talking about, the fact that you need, in order to get to the kingdom of shadows, you need those three different books, because there's truth in all of them, but there's a lot of evil in them. Now, you can flip that, because this is the wrong way, and say that um, a third of our books is false. So you can say that a third of the Bible is false, or a third of the Tanakh is false, a third of the um, uh, Quran is false, a third of the, um, the Hindu one was false. So in that way it's kind of interesting because it's uh, related to the third of the angels that fell, right? Um, so you've got uh, a third false, but uh, two-thirds good. And of course, they're doing it the opposite here. They've got um, a third being good. Um, which of course is the same thing if you're looking at Satanists, right? Satanists just need that third um, of evil that is in our Bibles, Quran, and everything uh, to follow that. So, see, I never would have made that connection, um, but that's why I think it's kind of important to look at stuff that's the wrong way to kind of see how it's related to the right way when you flip it. Continuing on, but as Johnny Depp's character Corso discovers, the engravings which appear in the three books are not all identical. In each book, six engravings are initialed AT for the book's author, Aristide Torquia, and three engravings are initialed LCF for Lucifer, widely speculated to be the co-author of the book. All of the AT engravings are identical, but the LCF engravings contain small variations in the symbolism, which greatly change the meaning of the scenes depicted. And because of the and because the engravings which are initialed LCF vary from book to book, all three books are necessary to obtain a full set of LCF engravings describing all nine gates. In order to illustrate the meaning of the variations in the symbolism of the engravings, the film has us follow along on the adventures of two main characters. The first, rare book dealer, Corso, starts out as a paid agent of his employer, Falcon, but with the help of an enigmatic character known only as The Girl, Corso manages to make the true journey, which is depicted in the LCF engravings, a journey from ordinary ego consciousness all the way to ultimate enlightenment and an experience of the world in the form which is symbolized in the Book of Revelation as the New Jerusalem. This ultimate destination which the traveler through the LCF gates reaches is symbolically represented in the film's final scene in which Corso walks into a castle blazing with light. There is a clear correlation between the order in which we see the engravings in the course of the film and the progress which Corso is making on his journey up the tree through the gates. The modifications which Roman Polanski and his fellow screenwriters made to the plot taken from the book are completely consistent with the symbolism of the journey depicted in the engravings, so much so that it can only have been intentional. Now I'm just going to point out that somebody led by demons could do things and it would be intentional on the demon part, but the people that are led might be totally spiritually blinded and uh, we don't know. I don't know if it was intentional on their parts, but um, our father can make things happen too. And if it is um, sharing the, the tree of life, perhaps it's something different. So, you know, like maybe it was, I don't know, for the purpose of a video like this to sort of um, expose what's going on, um, their, their journeys, and flip that to see our journeys. So I'm going to continue on. The second main character, Boris Balkan, is a business tycoon and lecturer on occult subjects who has dedicated his life to pursuing wealth and power and has assembled the world's largest collection of books on Satanism and the devil. After managing to gain possession of one of the three copies of the Nine Gates, he tries to use it to perform a ritual which he believes will summon the devil, and who will then grant him unlimited wealth and power. When his ritual doesn't work, he suspects forgery and hires Corso to track down the other two copies of the book. 
When Vulcan finds out from Corso about the LCF variations, he begins secretly shadowing Corso, ruthlessly murders the other book's owners, and steals the remaining six LCF engravings from their books, which he believes will allow him to conduct a successful ritual. Finally in possession of all nine of the LCF engravings, Vulcan travels to an abandoned castle apparently identical to the one depicted in the engraving for the Ninth Gate, surrounds himself with a circle of fire, lays out the nine engravings in an order of his own devising, and conducts a ritual in which he recites his interpretation of the meanings of the engravings. Confident of his success, he sets himself on fire to demonstrate his invincibility, and instead burns to death or he would have if Corso hadn't finally shot him as an act of mercy. When Corso later asks the girl why Balkan didn't succeed, she says it was because his LCF engraving of the Ninth Gate, depicting the castle in flames, was a forgery. But is it really as simple as that? As we will see, the journey which Balkan made in real life followed the path described in the AT version of the engravings and the path through the nine AT gates leads inevitably not to light, but to fire. So according to this, um, by following the wide gate, um, they are led to fire. And it's only those who are illuminated uh, and following the other path, the 33%, uh, that goes to the light. So. That, that's maybe why they consider themselves also elite. Um, it's only the 33%. Uh, that might be why they believe in the 33 also. Um, so if they follow the 33%, then they believe they go to the light. However, the 33% is the fake scripture from our scriptures. And if you follow the 66% of our scriptures, perhaps that will lead you to the light. And I know that there are truths in those other um, texts, such as the Quran, um, which would say, don't worship Jesus as um, Yahweh, because he always said that he wasn't Yahweh. And uh, Paul's a false apostle. So, you know, the Quran has some stuff that's right. And the Bhagavad Gita has that stuff about um, letting go of the self and following the Holy Spirit inside to um, to do His will instead of your own will. And of course, that's what Jesus taught, you know, taught us to do that. So that's right. And um, the Tanakh has that, of course, as I read um, Deuteronomy earlier, and it's all about giving you life and death, and you're supposed to choose life. And the prophets continually came and told them, you know, Yahweh never asked for sacrifices, and we're supposed to be doing his will, and stop with the pagan idolatry, and, you know, there's a lot of good there. So I believe that our father left crumbs in all of these different religious texts for us to follow, but 33% perhaps is fallen. And that is what would lead you to fire, whereas the rest would lead you to light. And of course, um, we know Jesus is considered the light of the world, and we are considered the light of the world, and our Father is the one who created the light, and, uh, you know, Lucifer is the light bearer. So we need to remember that um, Yehoshua is bearing lights, the menorah, candles in Revelation. And um, I don't believe that there is one fallen angel named Lucifer or Satan or the devil. I've talked about this in the past, and you can see my playlist on that. In order to keep this under 30 minutes, I'm going to stop here and continue on in the next part. Shalom.